And next to me here, I have Robert Sorbström. You are co-founder of the platform Climate Hero uh, that enables people to calculate, reduce, and also compensate their climate emissions. And next to you is Johan Falk. Uh, he is uh, resilient. Sorry, I'm just skipping here. You're a senior innovation fellow, Stockholm uh, Resilience Center, also Future Earth. And I'd like to start with you before I introduce the rest of the panel that will be joining us via Zoom, because you are, we need some um, hard facts on how low we need to go in terms of climate emissions and how quickly. So please, the floor is yours for five minutes, and then we'll uh, head over to the panel talk with Robert and the team on, uh, on via Zoom. Great. Give you a warm hand. Thank you, Katarina. Great to be here. I represent the Exponential Roadmap Project, which is supported by a number of research, civil society and business organizations, as you can see here. And we developed uh, one of the first roadmaps which is aligned with the Paris Agreement, built on exponential thinking and focus on the next decade, which is very important, the next 11 years. But back to your first question, what is required to save the climate. Science is very clear, as we heard today. We need to halve emissions by 2030, at least, I would say. And this is on a global level. And we must halve emissions every decade after that, three times on a global level. What is really important that we, the rich countries, cities and people, we should strive for a double speed, double up. It's absolutely essential, right? Okay. So this is what we call the Global Carbon Law, which was released uh, by scientists, Johan Rockström, Sheldon Owen Gaffney, and so on, about three years ago. And this is aligned uh, with the IPCC report. And if we follow this path, this pathway, we have a reasonable chance to stay well below two degrees and avoid the worst consequences and reduce the risk for a hot house earth. And this is a rule of thumb. It's easy to understand, which is really, really important. It works on all scales for countries, cities, companies, and for me as an individual. And it is achievable, but it is sufficiently tough. Uh, but what is really important when we talk about climate, we cannot just focus on driving down the emissions. Uh, we can only achieve this if we increase prosperity for all in terms of health, living, better air, better food, better society, and reaching the sustainable development goals. So to take it one step further, we created this Exponential Climate Action Roadmap as a sort of Lean Startup last year, it was launched at the Global Action Climate Summit, um, also mastered by Nick, who is sitting here. Fantastic event by, launched by Christiana Figueres and Johan Rockström. And this roadmap translates to around 30 solutions, which has the potential to take us to the first halving, across energy buildings, transport, industry, food and land, and so on, based on existing research from Drawdown, Citra, and a number of other research organizations. The focus is on the first halving, the immediate progress. And why is that? Uh, the more distant goals are very important as visions, but we need immediate action. The next 10 years, we must get the snowball rolling. So the first 10 years is absolutely essential. And this will drive the solutions for the second and third halving. That's the theory of change. So how does it look like? You should download the report, of course, but in energy, we see an exponential trajectory in terms of renewables and doubling every fourth years. And storage is following behind. So if we keep the same pace, there is an opportunity uh, to achieve this. In buildings, the solutions exist, in transport solutions exist, in industry solutions exist. In food and land it's very much about moving to a plant-rich diet and reduce food waste. As we talked about moving 
land to sinks solution exists, right? So our, solu our conclusion is that solutions to halve emissions by 2030 exist, but they must be scaled exponentially, right? They need to be accelerated. They won't happen automatically. They must be accelerated by strong climate leadership, policy, by fi finance. And in terms of climate leadership, what is really essential in the near term is that we get this critical mass of companies, cities, countries, and citizens starting to halving emission raising prosperity, showing that this is much, much more attractive uh, in order for it to scale exponentially. And we see a lot of signs in these directions. We need to do our utmost to push this. So the message from our perspective is that solutions exist, and it is achievable. It's desirable, and it's necessary. But we need to reach this critical mass now of companies, countries, cities, and individuals. Halving emissions, raising prosperity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Iran. Please take a seat and join the panel. Uh, thank you for your important work. I'll be addressing a few more questions to you uh, during the panel talk here. Thank with you. us here, we also have Chris Johnston. Dr. Chris Johnston, you were already with us in your keynote speech, specialist in positive change for those who didn't watch the first half. Uh, do we have Tiana with us? Let's see. Do we? Yes. Looking good. Thank you. And also we have Scott Amex is a new face here today for us. You're with us from New York. You're a New York Business Council member and partner of Amex Ventures. Uh, and you're there, your chair and managing partner. Thank you for joining us. And Daniel, we met already just a, a few minutes ago. And also we met Shota Chakraborty uh, with us from Zoom from the United States, from Washington, DC. And Chris is over there, wonderful. Tiana, um, I'd, I'd like to address you first because we were missing you in the talk before with Jamie. Um, first, we're gonna address the framing for this discussion is individual actions versus systems. So I'd like to start with you, Tiana. Um, how can we get the most momentum from the global youth movement? Um, and what would you say is the biggest effect it's having already? I think we need a little bit more sound from you. Can you can you turn up your mic and we'll do our best on our part? Um, can you hear me now? A little bit higher, please, if you can. Um, how about now? That's better. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Good morning. I'm Tiana. I, um, I co-founded Frontlines to Power through PowerShift Network, and this is our theory of change action. We believe that the global youth movement needs youth leaders to go inside themselves and really focus on three things. Um, we want to focus on transformative leadership. So while we are out here doing these actions, while we are creating strategies, while we are collaborating with our movement elders, with other organizations and communities, we're really working to make sure that our work is actually transforming people as they're coming into contact with us, when, whether that's peer to peer, organization to organization, or community to community. Second, anti-oppression tactics. So I and a lot of my peers really believe to get into the root of our actions, decisions, and beliefs. So that's changing our behaviors at an individual level within many collectives that we show up in so that we can actually shift power systems and structures through modeling the change that we want to see. Um, and lastly, specifically coalition building. So really working together to align our theories of change and see how we can come together to work towards the, the world we envision, the future we envision, through incorporating the different ways that we're trying to get there and aligning our efforts and our resources to have more decentralized resources, more grassroots leadership and more um, less linear goals and less linear focuses, but really focusing on the whole of the community and the whole of the leader so that we are transforming everyone that we're coming into contact with and we're communicating the urgency of the climate crisis because um, 
we hear many different angles of people coming at this crisis, but at the end of the day, the reality is marginalized communities of color, melanated folk, mm -hmm. queer folk, frontline people all around the world are the ones that are most impacted by the climate crisis. And we want to make that clear and support um, our communities in the global south, as well as our communities here on the front lines in the states. And so those are the, the three main focuses that, that I know I'm hearing, seeing, and pushing in the youth global movement. Mm -hmm. um, and that it's Thank very you. integral to change. Thank you, Tiana. Thank you. It's fantastic work that the movement is, is presenting. Uh, Scott Amix, you, you are in a different part of, uh, of the world, uh, and not, not geographically, but your, with your position. Um, what would you say is the, the responsibility for actions if you look at individuals versus the system from your point of view in, in, the, in the business world? Scott. I'd like to do, um, thank you. I'd like to share a story. Um, I'm originally from South Korea, and sometimes I'm asked as to why are Koreans so much into karaoke? Hmm. What happens is, if you understand anthropology, you understand that certain communal actions bring together people. So by singing and communing together, what we found out is that even though we're a very small country, and even just half of a peninsula, we're able to lock arms with one another to create incredible change. So just to give you a quick recap of South Korea, after the Japanese colonization and World War II, and then the civil war between North Korea and South Korea, by the time that Korea, South Korea came out of that in the 1960s and 70s or so, we had lower GDP than most sub-Saharan African countries. So how is it possible that in 40 some odd years, that half of a country can rise to become one of the OECD mm. and the G20. Why well, person lived through the 70s, and I've seen it firsthand what it takes. And it takes the individual working together with other individuals in a collective manner to bring about change. One of the biggest challenges that we see is that what we're going up against is of institutional resistance. It's a change that is so interlocking that it's very difficult to try to separate. So if you put your fingers like this and try to pry one of the fingers off, it just doesn't work. Mm. The political system, the capital system, and the industry and the special interests all work together to reinforce one another, to support particularly fossil fuels. So any try, anything that you try to go ahead directly would just simply have no effect. Now, one of the things that I'm very glad to see is the rise of the grassroots and activism, especially by the Gen Z and millennials. However, when I speak with some of the, like the Zora Power and other folks, is that I ask them, what is it that you're trying to achieve through these protests and marches? They say, well, we want our presidential candidates in 2020 to be able to put climate change as a top political priority. I said, great, do you think that's gonna work? And the co-founder said to me, no, we don't think it's going to work, but we hope that it works. Well, great. Well, if in fact the political system cannot achieve a efficient means, and we've seen it through the Paris climate change, the recent Poland uh, climate change summit, San Francisco climate change summit, all of these things, though we have great intent, cannot seem to get beyond the inertia of the political mm. system. So how do we actually move forward? to true action and the kind of scale and expedience that we just heard a few minutes ago. It requires for individuals in a crowdsourcing fashion to bring about change. Some of the most important changes, abolition of apartheid, civil rights, women's suffrage, independence from colonization, all of these came about because the individuals rose up together as a collective and said, we had enough, we we're willing to fight to the point that we will lose our lives for this greater movement. Only then, if and then, will we actually affect real change. Specifically, one of the most important pieces is, I drive a electric hybrid car, and I do all the right things from myself to think about my impact to my environment, my earth. But unless you address the root cause, which is really fundamentally the fossil fuels, it really doesn't matter if you drive Tesla, 
if you have solar panels on your roof, or if you have clothes mm -hmm. or cotton based mm -hmm. on microplastics, and you eat vegan foods, none of that will really matter unless you address the root cause. So one of the things that I'm really focused on is how do we accelerate the scale and production of clean energy with the participation of global citizens, which what this platform is all about. Thank, Thank you very much, Scott Amix, from, with us from the United States. Uh, I'd like to turn to Robert Sauberstrom here, um, just to address, I mean, you, you created a platform for co carbon conversation, mm -hmm. etc. Um, what is your take on the dynamics between the individual and the systemic responsibility? Well, <coughs> thank you. So, yes, as uh, Johan told us very well in the intro, we have about 10 years to cut the global emissions in half. And given that global emissions were still increasing last year, and I assume they will increase 2019 uh, as well, it's easy to feel, feel pessimistic. It's also quite easy to point your fingers at uh, countries such as uh, China and India, who contributed a, a, lot, a large part uh, to that increase. But when you consider the consumption footprint per capita in the world, these countries live much more sustainable than what, uh, what we do, who are in, in this room and may, may most of your people who watch this online. Because, in fact, 50% of global greenhouse gas emissions origin from just 10% of the world's population. Mm. That's the richest part that you and me uh, belong to. So, I mean, the first thing we need to do is to watch, look ourselves in the mirror and uh, to measure and understand our own carbon footprint. And then what Johan showed here is that we have all the solutions ready to actually do the first halving until 2030. Mm. But it won't happen by itself. Well, legislators, producers, consumers, we are interdependently connected and we need to take a common responsibility. We as climate hero, we take the perspective of the consumer. And we know if we don't start to demand climate friendly solutions immediately, they will not be adapted quickly enough. And we've proven that with use of positive psychology, it's possible to do that. We launched Climate Hero in Sweden less than a year ago, and so far we've reached 40,000 Swedish people. And on average, every person who's tried our climate uh, calculator mm -hmm. has pledged to reduce their climate footprint with 30% next year. And on top of that, many people have chosen to go completely carbon neutral. And we don't go for the very early adapters who are on the forefront. We go for the early majority. And that's what we need to do. There will be a tipping point. We heard about it earlier today here. When the early majority really start to demand and it will become the norm for climate-friendly solutions, then interdependently with producers, with the finance system, with the legislators, we can solve this. We have 10 years, but we don't have much time, and that's why we're here today. Thank you, Robert, and thank you for your work with Climate Hero. I'd like to get back to Shota Chakrabotri. Uh, what do you hear about Scott's, uh, the karaoke example, about the sort of the arm uh, hooking up uh, and moving forward as a, as a unity? Uh, as a behavioral scientist, what is, what is your take on the, the dynamics between the system and the individual and how we sort of get this moving movement further ahead? Sure, that's a, thank you for that question. So Scott and I have the privilege of being advisory board members. For I know. We don't have time. We also were able to meet in person at South by Southwest last month in Austin. And for those of you who might not be familiar with that event and platform, it's, it's become quickly becoming uh, where one wants to launch some sort of tech or innovation. It's become a showcase globally for advances and innovations of human ingenuity. And so Ingmar, the founder of We Don't Have Time and I, had the privilege of doing a soft launch of this platform um, at South by Southwest. And we're in good company. Twitter was launched at South by many years ago. Uh, Uber, many say, was mm -hmm. the idea came into being at South by Southwest. So the reaction we got last month from that audience was very positive. And that was really heartening for myself to see um, and, and for We Don't Have Time to feel some sort of uh, excitement about in that this is so necessary. It's such an advancement. There's been, it's been so well received already. There's a lot of support. 
And this is the kind of thing that Ingmar says really well, couldn't have been possible, wasn't possible mm. 10 years ago, but it's because of where we are now, because of tech, because of advances mm. that we are able to do this. So the opportunity here is incredible and there's so much potential. And I see it being a tool part of many tools. As a behavioral scientist, I encourage people to make adjustments um, that are cost effective. Not everything has to be an expensive science or tech solution, but behavioral interventions, science and tech, and using this type of tool, all is part of a larger toolkit that can be applied and that's available for everybody. So as an individual, you can do what you need to do, make adjustments, recognize where you have your shortcomings cognitively, Try do your best to overcome them. There's ways to do that. And then become part of a global uh, community and really do it together. So for somebody like me who does a lot of work in the media, when I come up against those who are climate deniers or those mm. who are really aggressive, now it's not just me that is applying my behavioral science knowledge and know-how to win them over, but now I can uh, look at this app, start a campaign and say, who's with me on this? And have you seen how I was treated or what, what, what people were saying mm. to me? Uh, I get a lot of negative pushback. And now I have the support of this community that can actually get behind me and we can, and not just me, any one of us, we can take full advantage of it. That's what's so cool, that's what's so exciting. And that's what the soft launch that we saw last month gave me a lot of um, hope towards seeing how this rolls out. Really looking forward to it. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, Dr. Chris Johnston, um, you talked about before earlier in your keynote about the, um, the being able to talk to oneself about moving forward in, in climate action. Um, how about the bridge between our values and our actions? Shota spoke a bit about that before. Uh, could you give any general advice to the audience here? We were just a few minutes ago, we were 1,600 viewers. I think we're more than that by now. They're nodding. Great. And we're all people here in the room. Uh, we want to take the step, but we don't really, uh, we can't really push ourselves. Any good advice from you, Chris? Well, first to say, I love what Robert was saying about helping people find their own carbon calculators mm. to kind of know where they are. And also the term cognitive dissonance has been used where there's a, there's a gap on the one side, I kind of feel I should be like this, but I see that I'm like that. And mm. I live in the rich part of the world where we're in overshoot and we need to change and it's uncomfortable. And what I find helpful is to reframe guilt as climate conscience. Oh. But when we feel uncomfortable about what we're doing is say, hey, that's my climate conscience speaking. Mm -hmm. It's telling me that my actions are out of step with the living planet. And that I love the idea of a beautiful life. A beautiful life is where uh, we live in a way that's good for us and also our world. And we need to pull apart the pursuit of happiness from industrial growth. We need to mm. recognize that they're, they're different journeys. We can have a better life, a bit like the Donut Economics was talking about development. Mm. It's the same with our personal development too. Personal development is not about having more. It's not about having more things. It's about living in a way that is more balanced, where we can feel integrity in our hearts, that we're living in a way that we know can continue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Daniel, I'd like to get back to you. Uh, when you listen to, to, uh, to the other speakers here and uh, relate this to your project work all over the world, what would you say is your success factor in bridging this gap of not wanting to really commit and move forward? Yes, thank you very much. And, and that's a very important thing. And I think I need to go back to what uh, Dr. Chris said. And it's important that People are overwhelmed because the, the content of what is out there have been tinted with science, politics, and personal and cultural addendums. Mm -hmm. Now, the way to solve the problem is to look for things that bring us all together. And Scott is right. Scott and Swart is right. That Do you know that 13 million people listen to music every day on either the uh, Twitter or the YouTube. And we all agree here that we need everyone on board to address the issue of climate change. It means those that are physically challenged, those that are deaf, those that we know fully well don't have TV, those that have, we need everyone on board. The only way we can achieve this narrative is to look for common things people like, 
and find a connection of everything together and give people a sense of purpose. Our purpose for now as human beings are this. If we continue to do the same thing that has brought us to this problem, it is called insanity. Mm. So the answer sure. is let us do a completely different thing that has brought us to this stage where everybody knows something is not right. So what my organization does is this, create content for everyone, tell you you have a role to play to something much bigger than mm. you and tell them that you have that moral obligation, that duty as an adult, never to hand over to your children a life that you worsened because you know too well that they do not have that capacity. Right now, they're not in government to make things better. Thank you, Daniel. I'd like to speak to all of you for another hour at least, but, but unfortunately we don't have that time and the schedule. I'd like to address the last question to, to you, Juan. Uh, you spoke about the exponential roadmap. Could you give us just a few examples of companies, uh, maybe even municipalities that are already using this tool? Yes, we talked about the, the only way to, 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 to make this happen is that we have to work on all the front lines mm -hmm. I, and I think we can't talk about either the individual or the city or the nation uh, or the corporations. So in terms of companies, we see uh, a lot of companies who goes much, much faster than the carbon law. They, can, they start to halve their emissions mm. in two, three years and so on. Uh, we really need to scale that to tens of millions of companies. But even more important that the companies start to provide the next generation solutions, which actually are fossil free, circular. And how will that happen? Well, of course, if we demand those solutions, we, we have a problem that high carbon footprint is still status for a lot of people. That has to change, right? We, have, we, have, to demand, mm. we have to demand the solutions. Mm. Then the companies will also provide these solutions much, much faster and they will scale exponentially. And of course, we need the bold policies changing the compass direction. We, we are, of course, influencing and trying to change the narrative, get an absolute hard focus on the next 10 years, not get away from that. We should halve or double half the next mm. 10 years. And that's for nations, for cities, and for us as individuals in the rich world. If we can get sufficient number going that direction, including cities, then it's achievable, I think. And we see some very promising examples yes. in your work, don't we? Wonderful. Well, thank you, the panel. I wish I could have talked to you longer, obviously. But, and thank you, Robert, and thank you, Yuan, for participating here in the panel. Give them a warm hand, all of them. Mm -hmm.